Chapter 12 of The Boy Scouts on Swift River by Thornton W. Burgess. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 The Story of a Lost Mine. The depths of a great forest, without the beating of a storm and the sloughing of the wind through tossing tree tops, a great fire snapping and hissing in defiance of the storm and reflecting its comforting heat into a snug waterproof tent wherein on dry blankets to sprawl in lazy ease having satisfied one's hunger there you have the place of places in the time of times for the telling of stories woodhull began by relating some of his experiences in the wilds of new brunswick and the tales of love and adventure of the habits of wild animals and of quaint superstitions which he had gathered from his guides a reference to a mine in one of these stories suddenly reminded hal that walter had never told him the story of the lost mine supposed to be somewhere within the watershed of swift river so when it came walter's turn for a yarn hal reminded him that he had promised the story when they should be near the scene of it i've heard of that story but never the story itself said woodhull we are within a day's paddle of the point nearest to the mountain where the mine is supposed to be and we couldn't have a better time for the story than right now fire away walt thus urged walter assumed the role of the storyteller and plunged into the legend of the lost mine and its guardian spirits i got this partly from an old history of this section and partly from a book of short stories of hunting and fishing in this region when it was still covered with virgin forest he explained the facts have been so long buried in superstition that the whole tale now seems legendary but i suppose it rests on a foundation of actual events it seems that when the first whites penetrated to this region they found it occupied by a tribe of indians allied with the famous iroquois confederacy better known as the six nations all through the french and indian wars and up to the time of the final treaty of peace with the indians the settlements were slow to push in this direction because of its isolation and the constant menace of attack by the bloodthirsty savages but after the power of the indians had been effectually broken and the pipe of peace lighted all along the border trappers and hunters from the settlements along the hudson and the mohawk began to push up into these mountains and settlers soon followed now on the banks of swift river near the foot of what is now known as mount tucker there still remained an indian village and they say that descendants of these indians are still to be found in the vicinity though most of them are half-breeds the whites and reds having intermingled there are still some pure bloods there and you'll probably have a chance to buy some baskets and souvenirs of them before we get through woodhall interrupted the head of this village was an old chief whose spirit had been sadly broken by the defeats of his tribe continued walter he was wise enough to realize the futility of digging up the hatchet again but his heart was ever turned from the white men and so far as possible he avoided having anything to do with them he had a granddaughter famous for her beauty and with her the old man made his home and of her he was intensely jealous her indian name meant the laughing brook and as laughing brook she was known through all this region the old chief spent much of his time in solitude it appears that on mount tucker he had a favorite retreat which overlooked the village from this point of vantage he kept guard with jealous eyes at the first sign of the approach of strangers particularly if they were of the despised and hated white race he hurried down to the village and laughing brook would be seen no more until the visitors had disappeared the beauty of the girl and the almost insane jealousy of the old man soon became topics of common gossip around the campfires and as usual in such cases such mystery as there might be was amplified by the imaginations of the storytellers until the old chief was invested with superhuman qualities and was currently believed to be possessed of magic powers if indeed he did not hold communion with the evil one himself finally he came to be looked on with something very like superstitious awe the very logical result was that he was left severely alone which was of course a result wholly to his liking he was said to possess the power of the evil eye and at his approach young and old alike avoided his glance strange noises were heard in the mountains sharp reports and heavy rumblings 
while the old man was known to be somewhere amid their solitude and while these undoubtedly were nothing more than reverberations caused by loosened boulders crashing down the mountainside or by sudden thunder showers they were accredited to supernatural agencies evoked by the old chief furthermore he was commonly reported to have great hidden wealth and to be possessed of the secret of a wonderful ruby mine where such an idea originated seems difficult to understand in this day but at the time it was very generally believed there was a tale of a wonderful necklace of blood-red rubies each one worth a fortune which the mother of laughing brook had worn upon a great occasion of state and which the old grandfather was believed to have hidden against the day when the indians should once more regain their land and laughing brook should wed the son of a great chief stories such as these grow wondrously in the telling and at that time were given as eager credence as are the golden tales of the fake stock promoters of to-day the ruby mine grew to contain gold and silver and to be guarded by evil spirits whom none but the old chief might exercise undoubtedly this feeling of superstition saved the old man much annoyance but for this unquestionably he would have been followed every time he went abroad at length these tales of the beauty of laughing brook and the ruby mines of the old grandfather reached the ears of a young trapper named tucker and commonly called red because of the fiery thatch of hair which crowned his great frame he was generally regarded as not knowing what the word fear meant and as for superstition he laughed at the scorn he listened eagerly to the stories of the girl's beauty and the old man's supposed wealth covertly smiling behind one of his big hands as the terribleness of the guardian spirits was enlarged upon the more he thought it over the more the adventure of the maiden fair and the wondrous necklace fascinated him and he resolved to attempt it with the opening of the trapping season in the fall those were evil days for the old chief on the banks of swift river red tucker was a noble figure of a man six feet four in his moccasins broad in proportion mighty of limb and devoid of fear none was so tireless on the trap line none brought in so great a store of pelts his blue eyes danced with fun and his great honest laugh rolled through the forest until the very echoes laughed back it is not to be wondered at that he speedily found favor in the eyes of laughing brook and because he was as bold in love as in all things else the old chief found himself powerless to prevent the frequent meeting of the lovers whenever red tucker came within range of his vision the old man glared at him with eyes in which hate and fear mingled to give them a baleful gleam red was warned lest he fall a victim to the evil eye and wither away but he only laughed the louder and straightway sought laughing brook to urge her to marry him at once but the little indian maid was coy more than this she loved the old grandfather and in her was that deep-seated filial respect which is the very basis of indian character it was not quite strong enough to prevent her meeting her big lover but it made her firm in her resolve to wait we are young and the years before us are many let us wait she would say with us it is the joyous springtime but with him the snows of winter weigh heavily and the fires burn low let us wait yet a little while let us wait so red tucker was forced to possess himself of such patience as he might he built a cabin a short distance from the indian village and soon was on the best terms with all save the grim old chief whose hatred of the pale face grew in proportion as laughing brook showed her growing love for him so the fall and winter passed and the spring came the trapping season was at an end the brooks and rivers were bank full the early wildflowers were peeping forth on the hillsides the honk of the wild goose was heard overhead and the laugh of the loon rang from the open water of the lakes the spirit of love and life and happiness was in the air laughing brooks sang in her wigwam and red tucker at his cabin in the clearing made with his own hands sang too now that the trapping was over and the ground was not yet ready for seed red found time hanging heavy on his hands he bethought him of the old yarns and the wondrous ruby necklace and the hidden mine whence the rubies were supposed to have come once he had asked laughing brook about the rubies but she had shaken her head as if she did not understand 
and he had not pressed the matter. Once, as he stood idly fingering a shell necklace about her neck, she had told him that her grandfather possessed a wonderful necklace, every other link of which was a red stone of great beauty, and that it was to be hers if she should marry in accordance with his desires. Now Red knew enough of Indian nature to be well aware of how great a value an Indian will place upon some insignificant bauble, and so he mentally discounted heavily the wondrousness of this necklace. But even then, there must be something in all these stories. Laughingbrook had herself told him that every other link was a wonderful red stone. Might it not be that the old chief in his wanderings had stumbled upon a ruby mine? Or perhaps the secret of it had been handed down to him by his ancestors? Stranger things had happened in other parts of the world. Why should not it happen here? Where did the old man go alone so much? Why did he go and what did he do? I have said that Red was without fear. He feared neither man nor devil. The superstitions which protected the old chief from the intrusions of others were no barrier to Red Tucker, and one idle day he took it into his head to follow the old Indian and see where he went and what he did. Perchance he might find the mind if any such existed. Just what happened on that tragic day never was known, and of course never can be now. It seems that the girl saw Red following her grandfather, and, in dread of what might happen should the old man discover him, she in her turn followed Red, probably with the intention of prevailing upon him to give over his plan of spying on the old man. The Indian appears to have gone straight to his usual retreat, at least that is the supposition, for no man knew just where that retreat was. In all events, he was known to have gone directly up the mountain and hard on his heels, albeit craftily, pressed Red Tucker. Behind Red, unknown to either of the others, sped Laughingbrook, a great fear in her eyes. It was a beautiful spring morning. Not a cloud was in the sky. All nature seemed rejoicing, save only on the grim mountainside. There the songs of the birds died in their throats as the three human figures glided in and out through the forest, and when they had passed, the birds remained mute so that a great silence fell as of dread expectancy. Just before noon the village was shocked to see Laughingbrook appear suddenly from the direction of the mountain, walking as one in a trance. Her eyes were wide open, and in them lay a great horror. She spoke not, neither did she seem to see those who crowded around her. Tenderly they led her to her wigwam, and unresisting she obeyed the old squaw who had been her nurse from childhood. She soon fell into a coma from which nothing could arouse her. Convinced that she was possessed of evil spirits, the village medicine man was sent for and at once began his weird rites and incantations to frighten the evil spirits away. Apparently he succeeded, for late in the afternoon the girl awoke and requested that she be left alone. Rejoicing greatly, her attendants hastened to obey. Just as the sun was setting and its low-flung rays turned to liquid gold the yellow flood of swift river, Laughing Brooks stepped out from her wigwam. She was arrayed in such dress as befitted the daughter of a chief on great occasions the dress in which, in happier days, she would have received the marriage proposal of some young chief of equal rank. Bead-embroidered fawn skin and rich pelts. Around her neck was the famous ruby necklace, looking neither to left nor right, but with the same fixed stare in her eyes with which she had returned from the forest, she passed among her people straight to the water's edge. Before a hand could be lifted to stay her, she launched her own canoe and with a few vigorous strokes of the paddle sent it to midstream. Then, turning its bow with the current, she suddenly flung the paddle far from her. Kneeling erect, she gazed steadily at the falls of the great spirit, toward which she was being swept. On the very brink of the falls she was seen to spread her arms wide as if to draw to herself someone dearly beloved. For an instant she seemed to be suspended on the very edge, her form sharply silhouetted in the red rays of the sinking sun, a white cloud of mist which, to the superstitious onlookers, 
appeared to take a human form, shrouded her, and from that day to this no trace of her or her canoe has ever been found. Of course, the famous ruby necklace disappeared with her. The failure of the old chief and of Red Tucker to return led to a search. They were traced part way up the mountain, but there all trace of them was lost. As they never were seen again, the mountain gradually became shrouded with superstition. It was commonly believed that Red Tucker found the mine, and that in revenge for trailing him and for stealing the affections of Laughing Brook, the old chief caused the evil guardian spirits to close the mine upon them both, and that Laughing Brook saw the deed. Ever since that time the mountain has been known as Mount Tucker. The belief that there was formerly some kind of a mine on it still prevails, but opinion as to just what the product of the mine was is divided. There have been many unsuccessful hunts for it. So far as is known, there is no mineral wealth of any amount in this vicinity. There you have the story for what it's worth. We ought to reach the scene of the Indian village tomorrow, and we'll have to carry around the falls of the Great Spirit. If we have time, I, for one, should like to climb Mount Tucker, concluded Walter. Want to have a look for the mine, Walt? inquired Lewis. Sure, that would be half the fun, replied Walter. What do you suppose those red stones and the necklace were? inquired Plumpton. You don't suppose they really could have been rubies, do you? Hardly, son, replied Woodhull. Remember that the Indian has always placed great value on the merest trinkets, providing they are bright. He is like a child in this respect. If such a necklace ever did exist, it is probable that the supposed rubies were merely red beads obtained in the course of trade. You'll find no rubies on Mount Tucker, but all the same I'm not so sure that there isn't mineral wealth in these old hills, undiscovered because the searchers have been looking for the wrong thing. Now everybody turn out and make things ready for the night. The storm is broken, and I believe we're going to have a bully good day tomorrow. End of chapter 12